Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Well, good morning. I'm really happy to be joining you this morning. Um, calling in from San Diego, so nice and early for me here, but really excited to be with you all um, and discuss this powerful topic of mental health and addressing inequities within tobacco control. To give you a little bit of background about Rescue, we're an agency that has spent almost 20 years with the goal of making healthy behaviors easier and more appealing. We work with a variety of local, state, and um, federal agencies, including DHEC, to tackle challenges like tobacco and vaping prevention, cessation, obesity prevention, and a variety of other public health topics. And we're unique in the sense that we're a full service agency, including research, strategy, creative development, media, and implementation. And all of our work is rooted in science. So I'm really excited to walk you through some of our vaping work today um, that's been in partnership with DHEC since 2018. So within this session, we're going to cover some key points surrounding the teen vaping crisis. We're going to hear about which teens are currently vaping, are all teens at equal risk, what has changed since COVID-19, and which are the most effective vaping and prevention um, cessation messages for teens. So let's chat a little bit about audiences and why segmentation is such a crucial part for understanding who we're reaching for tobacco prevention messaging. A key component in understanding who is the most at risk is clearly delineating the difference between equal and equitable. I'm sure many of you have seen graphics similar to this. Um, and in public health, we recognize that equal and equitable are not necessarily the same thing. While equality distributes the same resources to all, equity is necessary to address disparities by distributing resources based on need. This applies not only to physical resources, but also to the allocation of prevention messages and media. A lot of public health campaigns often describe their audience as everyone, and what this looks like in practice is developing and implementing one universal prevention message intended to reach, in, in fact, everyone. Um, and within kind of like youth and youth tobacco and vaping prevention, we can think about it as all teens who are susceptible for vaping. While it is, yes, important to ensure that everyone receives education, equal campaign delivery does not necessarily address those inequities. Higher risk individuals um, may be prone to mental health issues or toxic stress from ACEs. They need more support and specific messages that address their unique obstacles. So what does equitable prevention look like? To reduce health inequities, campaigns must be what we call at rescue, equitable by design. This means that additional messages are developed to address the unique barriers of higher risk populations, making new behaviors more realistic. Lower risk individuals require fewer messages to make desired changes because they have less risk factors to begin with, and they were less susceptible for call it vaping use. Messages must also be delivered through equitable media plans, such as over delivering to higher risk populations and fighting against digital media algorithms that tend to prioritize lower risk audiences. Our approach at Rescue ensures that empathy is applied to message development from the beginning with our research with high risk audiences in mind, and that we're developing a media strategy that is needs based first with meaningful action being prioritized to achieve equitable outcomes for the highest risk audience. Equitable prevention depends on our ability to differentiate between lower and higher risk individuals and direct additional resources based on risk. However, risk level is not necessarily a known variable. We can't necessarily target teens on um, you know, social media by, by their level of risk. And we certainly can't target things like TV ads either. Audience segmentation, though, is the process of dividing an audience into distinct subgroups of people with shared characteristics to allow us to do just that. And it allows us to reach our audiences with a more intentional message. Now, let's talk a little bit about strategies to more effectively develop behavior interventions to youth. And one way we do this is by using peer crowds within our youth prevention work. One of the most prominent predictors of risk behavior is a youth's social identity and the influence of his or her peers and peer groups. Peer groups are aggregate, uh, peer crowds are aggregate peer groups with similar values, connections, affiliations, social tendencies, and habits. Understanding peer crowds and the values that represent each crowd presents a key segmentation opportunity for us to develop tailored campaigns that more equitably deliver messages and media to higher risk youth. In fact, what you may not realize is that this has been a key component of addressing tobacco control within the state of South Carolina for the past few years. 
So if you've sat in on any rescue presentation before, you've potentially seen this, but for those that haven't, we have five main teen peer crowds that we've identified in our research. Each size of the circle that you see here on the screen is relative to the peer crowd size within the overall teen population. Peer crowds aren't necessarily based on race or ethnicity, but rather on common interests, motivations, values, and influence. And each peer group provides us with an opportunity to understand their subculture and develop tailored messages that are designed to resonate with their intrinsic motivations that can ultimately influence long-term behavior change. This is why segmentation is a really crucial part to how we address youth tobacco prevention, because we want to ensure that our messages are resonating with their subculture and their values rather than speaking to just one overall teen population. So what we did is we worked with DHEC um, to build upon previous segmentation research that was already in motion starting back in 2015. And once that groundwork was established, we were able to advance our understanding of each peer crowd and their highest their risk for use developing tailored messaging to reduce prevalence um, statewide through a variety of different campaigns that are currently active today. So what does this look like in practice? Well, you know, we were fortunate enough to partner with DHEC and use our iBase in statewide tobacco surveys to better identify risks associated with peer crowd. Our iBase survey is basically a survey that's based on a series of questions to better understand where teens fall within each peer crowd. Now, when we look at South Carolina Youth Tobacco Survey data in 2019, and looking at the portion of teens who actively vape, we see vape use spike amongst two key peer crowds, particularly alternative and popular with country and hip hop very close behind. And, you know, as I mentioned in a previous slide um, and going back to those little bubbles, we saw those circles of peer crowds. While alternative peer crowd is the highest risk for use, just to note that this peer crowd comprises just about 5% of the teen population. So while it's lowest in population density, all this means is that we can be thinking and factoring in messages that speak directly to topics and values that we know play a direct influence in their life. Now, this peer crowd breakdown that you see here is actually very consistent with data that we've seen in other states. And what this has told us is that when we're targeting teen vaping, we, we should really have a popular message um, that's going to reach a majority of teens, potentially with that hip hop influence. And in thinking about how we can infuse messaging and values highly evident with other high risk peer crowds so we can be more effective in our approach. All segmentation does is really help us understand where our messaging should land, what channel it should land on, what website it should land on, and it helps us make sure that we're providing a more equitable prevention campaign, prioritizing those who need to hear our message more. Now, when we look at the two largest peer crowds at the highest susceptibility for vape use, we see this breakdown in two ways. We have popular and hip hop. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have our country peer crowd and our alt team peer crowd, which we'll talk about in a little bit in terms of how we can reach those teens um, more effectively. But when we look at the teens who are at the highest risk, um, you know, we wanna understand kind of like, why is this the case? Why popular teens, why hip hop teens? Well. One easy reason for that is Juul and thinking about their marketing efforts that we saw um, back in the day. So pre-Juul, we saw teens who were already susceptible for use, you know, using cigarillos, experimenting with tobacco. Those are the ones that were vaping, but that totally changed with Juul. Popular teens used to be the kids who hated cigarettes and suddenly they were interested in vapes because of the style and coolness that came with this kind of marketing. So because of this, popular is now one of our biggest group of vapors that we're seeing statewide in South Carolina but then also across the country, um, again, with some of that hip hop um, teen, teen peer crowd who are also at heightened risk. So when we look at messaging and how we want to reach those teens most effectively and how we tackle this particular problem, we need to zoom out and look at the spectrum of vape use we see in teen populations. On the left here, we have our non-triers, and these are teens who don't currently vape. They're not likely going to start. Then we have susceptible teens who are just an offer away from vaping for the first time. They indicate on surveys that they're curious about vaping and they're open to trying, especially if a friend offered. Then we have experimenters who have vaped one to nine times in the past 30 days. And on the right, regular users who may have vaped 10 or more days in the last 30 days. And these teens may or may not be addicted to nicotine. And of those who may be addicted, they might not believe they're addicted. Um, but they're also potentially at heightened risk due to mental health issues or ACEs. So what we aim to do with DHEC is develop messaging that addresses the mindsets of teens at each stage on the spectrum based on their susceptibility and or patterns of use. 
First, we start with a layer of prevention since all teens can benefit from foundational education about vaping to fill in some of those knowledge gaps and misinformation. And depending on the stage of use and reasons why they use, the communication need is slightly different. non trier and susceptible teens need a message that convince them not to start. Experimenters need messages that convince them to stop using even though they've started. And regular users need compelling reasons to quit. A prevention campaign may introduce a new reason to quit, like mental health, impact on immunity or lung health, and depending on the audience you're reaching, may need to be tailored to ensure we're reaching at-risk audiences more equitably. And this includes a variety of different campaigns um, that address various peer crowds. So, you know, we're going to talk about in just a moment, but another, you know, example that I just want to share too is, you know, we have a campaign called um, Fresh Empire that we developed for the FDA, um, and that, you know, specifically targets multicultural youth who are at higher risk and potentially experiencing ACEs. So when we look at the campaigns currently active in South Carolina, um, you know, we've had the opportunity and the privilege to partner with DHEC since 2019 to bring tailored messaging and ready-made brands to youth within the state. As you remember a few slides ago, we saw various peer crowds spike for vape use more than others. And this is just a snapshot of how we're addressing this problem. So when we think about you know, vape use, we're also considering traditional tobacco use or other products like chew. So starting on the left here, we have our alternative peer crowd campaign blacklist, our country peer crowd campaign down and dirty, and this campaign associates being tobacco free with country values and lifestyles. And then we have a larger statewide effort, which I'll be um, spending majority of this presentation on talking through is behind the haze and our vaping effort. Um, and then finally, this last year, we're really excited to share that we've had the opportunity to pilot a virtual quit program um, with teens across the state through a, a program called Quit the Hit. Um, it's, a, it's a virtual cessation group for, for teen vaping. Now, all these campaigns have been live for a couple of years now, and we're continuing to conduct new research and developing new messaging to reach these teens where they're at. In fact, the approach that we have in South Carolina is really special. It's, I would call it honestly the gold standard in how we should be addressing youth prevention because we're bringing tailored messaging to youth statewide, but we're delivering those messages equitably and, and taking into consideration various social determinants of health along the way um, and really building out messaging based on you know, their unique values and beliefs. So we're going to take some time just to, to focus in on the vaping epidemic and learn more about how we're combating this across the state. Behind the Haze is Rescue's ready-made campaign to fight teen vaping and to proactively you know, counter the sudden uptick we saw in vaping across all peer crowds, we developed this brand back in 2018 to provide states and communities with a ready-made solution to bring prevention messaging to the community quickly. Behind the Haze is a campaign that currently targets 13 to 21 year olds who currently vape or who are at risk for starting vapes. They mostly identify with popular and hip hop. Um, they're ethnically and economically diverse. They're more likely to engage in social activities and they have significantly higher Instagram and Snapchat use than non vapers. Behind the Haze is currently being utilized um, in South Carolina, as I mentioned, but also, you know, with this collaborative community of stakeholders across the country, resulting in what we're really proud to share is, you know, this national movement of shared learnings, data, research, and insights, and how we can most effectively work together to tackle the vaping epidemic and reach those who continue to be at heightened risk for vape use. Now, I want to share a little more behind the scenes of our research because that's a really critical component of this campaign. These findings are the culmination of research that we've conducted since the inception of this campaign with vaping teens both pre and post COVID. Because we have such a strong collaboration of partners like DHEC interested in fighting this public health topic together, we've had the opportunity to conduct over 50 teen focus groups between 2018 and 2019. 86 focus group participants in two states right before COVID hit, and then 55 online interviews in three different states post COVID. Now let's take a moment to look at some of the changes and trends that we've seen in teen vaping behavior since the pandemic began. First and foremost, experimenters seem to have reduced their use. This is largely due to fewer peer interactions um, with shutdowns, less access, more parental supervision. Previously, it was a social activity, so occasions for use have gone down. Sellers have increased their prices, and teens say that this is an opportunity for them to reflect 
um, oh, sorry, I lost my spot, um, to reflect on their motivations for use, realizing that peer pressure was a motivation. Some of the quotes that we've heard in South Carolina, I'm not using right now because I'm not hanging out with people. When I'm hanging out with, let's say my friends or something, I'm gonna take a hit of their vape every once in a while, just to kind of blend in with people. That said, regular users seem to have increased their use. So many describe feeling bored, stressed, anxious, lonely, or unmotivated as a result of their current circumstances, and vaping became a coping mechanism for them. Other stressors included difficulty adapting to distance learning, social isolation, and a shortage of activities to do at home. They're prone to mental health issues, heightened by you know, toxic stress like ACEs. And initially access was hard, but new sources have been quickly identified like Snapchat um, as just a common way for you know, youth to exchange and converse and, and get access to, to devices. So some of the quotes that we've heard, I know a lot of people are stressed. A lot of my friends are put into different situations where they get really stressed out by family and they'll just go out and smoke. They get stressed and they're looking for a way to relieve it. And people have started vaping more. They have a lot more free time. Since everything's shut down, they really don't have anything to do. Basically, everybody just sits at home in their PJs and vapes. It's basically a hobby. So let's talk about how we can have effective prevention messages in the age of COVID. When we look at prevention messaging with the lens of health equity, it's more apparent where we can be intentional in our approach. As COVID restrictions loosen, it's critical that we continue to educate teens and give them more reasons not to use, arming them with information to mitigate future use as social activity starts to pick up again. We know that based on our research that susceptible teens are more responsive to this type of message, while more frequent users will need stronger physical health harms messaging to further convince them not to use. So when we look at prevention with the lens of equity in the coming year, especially, it's important that we have a balance of both. We can educate teens based on a variety of risk factors like environment or circumstance for the lower to medium risk audiences. And for higher risk teens, we can speak to what they're going through with a more, more empathy, incorporating issues like mental health or relatable obstacles to have a more impactful approach. First, I wanna you know, share an ad with you that's driven by empathy at its core and more relatable for a higher risk teen. This ad is from our campaign, Fresh Empire, that we developed for the FDA. Um, in fact, we did do an amplification in partnership with South Carolina to you know, feature this, this ad um, with teens across the state. And this campaign was designed to reach at-risk multicultural teens, potentially with ACEs, and associated key values like achieving your goals with being tobacco-free. So I'm going to go ahead and play this, and if you guys can't hear the sound, just let me know. Um, hopefully it works. Um, Big Creek, K-R-I-T, it stands for King Remember the Time. I'm known for making that gritty, southern, humble country music. The journey didn't start just going straight to Atlanta. It started from going from Meridian, Mississippi, to Birmingham, Alabama, and then to Atlanta. And from that point, that's when the journey got really real. Pretty much being homeless, living in hotel rooms, by myself, 18, 19 years old. It showed me that I'm strong enough, and I'm talented enough, and I'm creative enough, and I come from a place where people don't even expect that. What I've noticed nowadays is that a lot of people are using their vices to be creative, and all you're doing is handicapping yourself. The way I feel about tobacco is, is that it's not for me because knowing that it's the leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. is crazy. We all need to be healthy. We all need to be in our tip top shape 100% to go out here and do what we do every single day, no matter what. It's that Mississippi native Big Crit and I keep it fresh and tobacco free with Fresh Empire. So hopefully everyone can hear that. Um, but as you can see, this ad really highlighted the personal obstacles that Big Crit went through, striking a relatable tone for an audience who may be experiencing adversity or obstacles within their daily lives. Now, when we look at other impactful messaging areas, we can identify three promising strategies that can be tailored and scaled to reach audiences more equitably. 
While vaping chemicals and cultivating distrust in the vaping industry has been an, an effective approach in helping shift knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs surrounding vape use among teens, communicating health harms continues to be an effective angle in speaking directly to teens who are the most at risk. As we just learned, our recent research has demonstrated an uptick in mental health as an ongoing concern by teens, as well as a reason for their use. Given that our higher risk teens are struggling, we wanted to develop a mental health specific ad that speaks directly to this insight, providing them with education on how vaping can actually exacerbate mental health concerns. So just one thing to know is that every single ad that you're seeing here today is based on what we call a perceived effectiveness index. Um, it's basically a, a scoring system that uh, is used by the CDC to help us understand how motivating and impactful our messaging will be. So every ad in South Carolina um, that is run is based on this score. So I'm going to go ahead and share our mental health ad with you now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play that. Vaping does more than damage your body. Huh? It manipulates your mind. What? Nicotine messes with important neurotransmitters, like acetylcholine, which affects your emotions. It overwhelms the receptors, triggering a change in your brain that has been linked to depression, stress, and anxiety. Ugh. And every hit threatens to make you feel worse. Is vaping messing with your Ugh. mental health? Find out at BehindTheHaze.com. So based on some recent research that we just conducted within the last couple months uh, with vaping teens in Virginia who are susceptible for use and may be experiencing mental health issues, we, we heard that they really liked the focus on mental health. They appreciated the direct scientific information and they liked the animation style. Some of the quotes that we heard is that, you know, the stress of anxiety and depression part, it really hit because I feel like a lot of people go through those and they just, they don't know why. Another quote we heard is that it's sort of warned against vaping from a scientific perspective, you know, based on what it does to your brain. And I did like that because it wasn't just, you know, fear with fear mongering without evidence. So now I want to go ahead and take a moment to, you know, walk you through some effective cessation messages in the age of COVID and how we can be more effective in our approach. So, you know, looking ahead at cessation strategies for heavier vaping teens, despite some potential reductions in less risky teens vaping, as of 2020, there were still 3.6 million youth vaping. And as we just discussed, many of those teens continued their use throughout COVID, with some even vaping more as a result. Many teens started vaping because they didn't know or they didn't believe in the risk of addiction. There was a lot of misinformation out there. And now they're in a really tough spot when they want to quit. The good news, though, is that according to the American Medical Association, 45% of teens who vape do want to quit. And that's a trend that we're seeing within our focus groups and even with teens in South Carolina as well. In fact, follow-up surveys from um, our Behind the Haze campaign in South Carolina show that increased exposure to Behind the Haze prevention messaging has increased intent to quit in the future by over 50%. In a sample of over 190 South Carolina teens, 86% of vape users indicated that they intend to quit vaping. These findings have been really informative in developing our cessation efforts in partnership with DHEC, which we'll be going over in just a minute. When we look at, you know, the teen, the teen vapor's path to cessation and the teen who needs cessation messaging, what we saw, you know, in our, in our research, though, is a gap starting to emerge in what regular vapors needed to quit. We heard teens express hesitations about calling a quit line because it felt too formal and like they have a serious problem if they call. Some weren't 100% ready to quit or just wanted to learn more about how it would work and are willing to give it a shot. Um, and some also seemed concerned that their parents might find out. We also found that teens felt pretty alone in the quitting process. A lot of teens feeling like they're the only person in their friend group who want to quit. And many were hiding vaping from parents, coaches, and other support systems in their lives. They felt like a lot of the advice they heard was generic and wanted to hear from real teen experiences. Lastly, we heard that teens are generally pretty shy about using the phone and would be more comfortable using something familiar like social media. 
some teens may feel ready to go straight to the quit line. You know, they have the support from their parents. They're, they're aware of those available resources and they're taking quitting really seriously. But these teens, you know, as we, we talked about, you know, equitable, equitable prevention and equitable distribution, you know, they're less risky because they have access already to resources that can help them quit and that's readily available. However, the majority of teens in you know, our research were occupying this in-between space. And so what we really strive to do is fill that gap. So with those insights fresh in our heads, we set out to see if we could solve this problem. So what we did is we clustered our key findings into two key areas of cessation support that are missing. The first was the need for foundational cessation education. First, the vast majority of teens we spoke with didn't know much about the quitting process. They were confused about why they would pick a quick date, what the quitting process could look like, and they weren't familiar with a lot of common coping strategies that could help make quitting easier for them. Of the teens who tried to quit in the past, the vast majority of them tried cold turkey without a solid plan. Then teens got stuck in this brutal loop of trying to quit and failing, trying again and failing, and starting to believe that they actually couldn't quit. There is a significant need for teaching teens how to quit and what we know to be successful in terms of quit tools. Secondly, we heard that peer support was really important to them. We know that teens start vaping in a super social environment, so it made sense to us that we should provide peer support as part of the quitting process too. They need to know that teens like them are quitting to shift the social norm and build their confidence in quitting together with other teens. By providing cessation education and peer support to normalize quitting, we set out to create a cool and easy way to proactively deliver resources and options for teens where they are at, and perhaps even get them more comfortable accessing quitline services for ongoing support in the future. And we have a history of doing similar programs that have demonstrated success when we provide resources to smokers in a setting and environment where we know that they're going to be receptive. In partnership with UCSF Center for Tobacco Control Research and Hope Lab, it's a social innovation lab based in Northern California, what we wanted to do was do an assessment of quit resources and plot out their unique features, ranging from quit vaping apps to text to quit programs. Um, I know we have truth here, so it's going to be really great to hear that program in more detail. Um, but what we wanted to do with this exercise is see, you know, how the support was designed. Is it designed for vaping, designed for teens, if there's an app download, if there's peer support, and every single offering that you see on the screen has a ton of strength and a ton of value, but what we wanted to do was develop a solution that had all of these features to help ease teens into the path of cessation where they can be more successful with these programs. And again, as I mentioned, this is modeled off of an evidence-based approach that we've taken with high-risk young adult smokers. Um, I'd be happy to share more about that with you if you if you have questions um, after, after the session. So, you know, this, this brings us to Quit the Hit um, in our virtual cessation support group program that's currently live in South Carolina. Um, and what this is, it's, it's a quit vaping um, virtual, virtual quit groups that are hosted 100% on Instagram where we know teens are at. And what we're doing with this program is we're bringing the resource to teens in, in mediums where they're comfortable with peers that they're comfortable with. Each group includes 12 to 15 teens and a cessation coach, and it includes 30 days of online quit support with daily educational content, group challenges, and access to both peers and the coach for support throughout the quitting process. It's also worth noting that recruitment for the program can, can be tailored to reach certain priority populations who have been disproportionately impacted by vaping or might have less access to services in their communities. In terms of the development process um, and ensuring that we're confident in how the program would land, we engage with over 200 teens about their lives today to you know, better understand kind of like their activities, what's important to them. And across both Hope Lab led interviews and Rescue's formative research with teens, we've engaged with nearly 400 teens with vaping experience. We've conducted in-depth co-creation sessions with nine teens to ensure, to ensure the teen experience was really in the driver's seat during program development. Also, it's important to note that this is a science-based driven intervention uh, driven by researchers who have led clinical trials for NIH funded and, and two state of California funded efforts on social media-based interventions designed for young people. So now I wanna give you a little preview of, of the program and, and how it works and what the experience might, might feel like um, in the eyes of a teen.
So when we're looking at the program results across each uh, the, the pilot program that's currently live in South Carolina, um, you know, we're, we're analyzing three layers of data. First, we want to ensure that we're reaching the right teens and the teens who really need cessation support. Second, once the teens are enrolled, are they engaging in the program? And, and lastly, are teens actually quitting? So, you know, I'm going to take the next few slides just to walk you through some very high level initial results on what we've seen thus far. First, you know, let's look at engagement. Um, the engagement we're seeing in the groups is exactly what we wanted. Um, we're seeing over 73% of teens remain active through day 30 of the program. Uh, we know that quitting is not easy and these groups really give teens a safe space to vent and share their struggles and slip ups without judgment. Many of these teens are, are managing truly difficult personal situations. A lot of teens citing ACEs, family trauma, and struggles with mental health conditions on top of you know, those day-to-day -day stressors at school and with friends. Um, and in included here are just some examples of ways that they're finding motivation to quit, getting support from peers, and in celebrating the small wins. And as I mentioned, you know, this, this program has been live in South Carolina, and we're really pleased to report that over 140 teens have completed this 30-day program. And, you know, after each, um, you know, program, we are doing 30-day follow-ups. So these, these program surveys are currently in motion. So it's a small sample thus far in terms of the, the teens who have responded to the follow-up. But um, what's been really exciting is to see that 25 out of the 37 teens um, who completed the program stayed quit free um, or stayed quit, if you will, uh, with um, coming out of that program, reporting no vape use in the past seven days. So that's a really exciting and, and promising result. And as we continue to compile um, all of this data, we'll definitely be, be thrilled to share out, you know, the culmination of this program um, and all of the hard work and, and effort that we put into it with DHEC. So just some key takeaways, you know, to, to kind of sum it up and, and tie it up with a bow. Um, you know, first and foremost, we want to understand who is at risk um, for vaping use and in tobacco use and why. Why are they at risk? What is driving some of those risk factors? You know, we want to understand how they're going to respond to our messaging. And, and finally, be intentional with the campaign and, and de delivering media to those who are the, high at the highest risk to reduce inequities. So that's, that's all I have for you today. And, and thank you so much again for, for all of your time. I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Can I take a look at the, the chat box here as well if anything has come through? Thanks, Kristen. There were a couple questions in there. Uh, let's Are these studies of teens on vape experimenters and regular users mainly done on urban suburban teens? Um, so that's a really, really great question. Um, what we try to do with our focus groups is make sure that there's a good balance. Um, and typically when we're, we're going into research with the state, we, we do wanna make sure that we're um, getting interviews with both rural teens and urban teens. Um, so that way we can also you know, segment the data and understand which messaging components are the most relevant based on you know, geographic location, but then also layering in their values. So yes, we, we do try to have a balance of both. Um, I see another question coming through from well, Mike. We, well, we have a hand raised. We're only going with chat questions for today. Mike, could you throw your question in the chat box, please? And Regina asked about the presentation. We're going to post um, video as well as uh, presentations sometime next month, and we'll let everybody know. So again, please put all your questions in the chat box. Uh, Mike, if you can hear us, go ahead and type yours in for us. What is DHEC doing to help youth who smoke cigarettes to quit? Um, that's a great question. Um, we are actually discussing, you know, future strategies with um, with DHEC in the, in the coming fiscal year. So one of the key components right now is because vaping use is so prevalent um, and it affects, you know, all teens, um, including those who smoke cigarettes. Uh, we do see kind of dual use, multi-use, especially with our country peer crowd, um, is, is starting with our vaping cessation program 
program. And then based on those findings, it would be really great to see how we can potentially tailor the program um, for youth tobacco use. But right now, the, the current program is, is being piloted for vape use only. So I think that um, looking at, you know, follow-up surveys from Call Our Down and Dirty campaign and other campaigns where we see tobacco use continuing to rise, um, that'll certainly be um, an opportunity for us to explore um, as the data becomes, you know, more urgent. But. Kristen, there's a couple questions about availability of the program. Where are y'all in terms of South Carolina and offering yep. it more general public? Yeah, so the, the program is currently offered statewide. If you are interested in bringing this to your community and have teens who would you know, meet the criteria, they're currently vaping, they're looking for a quick resource, um, would highly suggest you know re reaching out. Um, right now, we're, we're recruiting teens through advertising, um, but certainly are open um, and, and willing to you know look at other ways to disseminate the program, um, albeit you know, like through schools or you know, other, other services and resources. Resources. So it is it is active, it is live, and would love to chat um, and touch base with you on how we can bring it to your community um, more, in, uh, more um, you know, intentionally. So that way we can recruit youth. And then um, I am seeing, hi. oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, is nicotine a cause of depression, anxiety, and stress or kids who have these mental health problems? problems more likely to use nicotine products. Um, so, you know, it's hard because based on the science, we can't say that it's causal, but certainly it can exacerbate mental health conditions. So that is really kind of the key insight that we wanted to, to focus on is that um, just based on the chemicals, it can disrupt, um, you know, those receptors in the brain. And so just arming them with that information, knowing that it's certainly not helping their mental health issues um, is, is really the kind of key insight we wanted to focus on with the message. And then another question came through, um, can this be tailored specifically to accommodate Native American culture or otherwise identify Native American participants? Yes, absolutely. Um, we are constantly, you know, building out new content. We're tailoring the program for a variety of different, you know, specific peer crowds and subcultures. So 100% we, we can tailor, um, you know, the program to, to reach that population. And we do have, you know, quite a variety of assets um, that can be tailored um, visually to to reach them we're we're actually just so everyone is aware we are working on a native american campaign with the fda so when that is ready um, that is a potential you know for us to to bring it to the community as well um, the current research on pro on the correlation between energy drinks and vaping nicotine usage causing extreme anxiety depression poor mental health um i don't have uh, that research on me, but I would be happy to look into it. Um, I would not be surprised um, just based on what that can do to the body, but but certainly would, you know, can definitely chat with my research team and see if there um, are any studies that we can pull up and, and circle back with you all. I think also Smoke-Free SC can connect with um, BHEC and get more information about the plans to make Quit the Hit available more broadly. And we can announce that through our messaging um, platforms as well. Great. Okay, any more questions? Although these programs are for teens, is there evidence on the impact for young adults? Uh, yes, the, the Quit the Hit program is actually based on a young adult intervention that we conducted in both Minnesota and California. Um, and we, we do have a ton of data and I have a case study that I'd be happy to share as well. I can share it, I guess, with, with you, Rebecca. Um, it can be an additional resource. Um, but yes, absolutely, there is a lot of value in, in tailoring a campaign specific to young adults. Uh, and, and that's how we actually developed this program. Anybody have any additional questions for Kristen? We thank you very much. Thank you so and, much. Uh,